afternoon, everyone. Uh, so for those of you who I have another chance to introduce myself, my name is Fazad and I'm a postdoc at the ME department working with Dr. Genzali on basically all technologies related to uh, reciprocating IC engines. And today I will be uh, basically talking about our recent efforts on developing an extinction-based extinction diagnostic to probe optically dense spray fields uh, relevant basically to, mostly relevant to diesel sprays. But before delving into the details of this diagnostic, I would like to take the opportunity and briefly introduce the, uh, our research facility as well as the type of activities that we do in our group. So as I mentioned, in the Sophia lab, we conduct fundamental uh, investigations on spray physics and combustion phenomena relevant to reciprocating IC engines, whether that is gasoline engine or diesel engine. But in order to avoid the complexities introduced by moving parts in a cylinder, as well as the limited optical access to an actual engine, we do all the experiments in a high pressure and high temperature facility, which is a kind of like unique uh, facility for itself. So this, uh, this facility enables us to simulate the thermodynamic environments that we encounter in a, in a diesel engine or in an engine environment, basically. Allowing us to, to not only vary the chamber pressure and temperature up to 100 bar and in close to like 1,000 Kelvin, we can also vary the concentration of oxygen in the chamber in order to, uh, to simulate the, the impact of engine, you know, exhaust gas recirculation. The other unique aspect of this facility is that it has multiple large optical access into it, which allows us to, to perform both uh, orthogonal and uh, line of sight diagnostic of the, the phenomena that happens uh, in a simulated engine environment. Currently, we have three active projects that are going on in our lab. Uh, the first project is about ductive fuel injection technology, which aims to to achieve suitless combustion in diesel engines. So here we try to understand and promote the uh, utilization of linear lifted flame combustion in again like diesel engines. The next project is about a spectral microscopy of uh, primary breakup of liquid jets, like high pressure fuel injection. And in this project, we aim to overcome the limitations imposed by the limited and fixed throughput of high speed cameras in order to acquire high speed, uh, high resolution, images in the near nozzle region. And finally, the project that I'm directly involved with is developing an infrared-based diagnostic to probe optically dense regions in the close vicinity of the uh, nozzle. And that is going to be the focus of today's talk. So diesel sprays are extremely challenging environments to quantify. So here you see a uh, image of basically a video of uh, diesel injection at 1500 bar back pressure injected into a chamber at roughly 600 bar back pressure. So one of the major challenges that we have to deal with is the spatial temporal scales of the injection processes. So we have lengthy scales like the breakup lengthy scales of on the order of few microns that are traveling at velocity, extremely fast velocities, close to 600, about 600 meters a second. And if this is not enough of a challenge by itself, we are dealing with extremely uh, dense environments. So they are optically dense, the light doesn't propagate through that much. This, these challenges make the utilization of existing uh, diagnostics very ineffective. The diagnostics like PDPA are not like really suitable to, to quantify the drop of field in the regions. I'm oh, sorry in the regions close to the nozzle. So the near nozzle region is referred to as 100 diameter of the nozzle. Even though recently, uh, oh, sorry. Recently there has been proposed like some X-ray based diagnostic to probe these regions, but they also come with their own challenges and complications. For example, the ultra small angle X-ray scattering measurement that's conducted, it's done at Argonne National Labs, is extremely resource intensive. I was recently talking to Chris Powell from Markon Lab, and they only do this kind of measurement five days per year. So you can't imagine like how much demand is on this kind of diagnostics. As a result of these complications, our fundamental understanding of the breakup phenomena is lacking currently. And that motivates us to go ahead and develop an in-house diagnostic, which is capable of um, 
accurately probing these, uh, these phenomena in the near nozzle region. So uh, the diagnostic that I'm going to, to describe and explain today is, is essentially based on the earlier work of Terry Parker from Colorado School of Mines. And it is essentially based on laser extinction due to line scattering events off of droplets of, you know, the, the fuel droplets. Here you see a schematic of a simple extinction measurement. We have the laser light going through this ray field. It gets attenuated and then collected by the, the optical receiver. Knowing the, uh, the extinct light intensity and the, the illumination light intensity, we can relate it to the optical density of the media through the Beer-Lambert law. Where the tau here uh, represent the optical thickness or the optical depth of that media that light is propagating through. The optical thickness can, is, is essentially the uh, path integration of extinction cross-section, which is effectively the shadow of that particle when illuminated by a given wavelength, and the number density that is n here. We can further simplify this to this following form, where n is the path integrated number density of the droplets in the probe volume, l is the integration length scale, which is essentially the, uh, the width of the jet that light is going through, and c extinction bar is basically the mean extinction cross-section, again, in the probe volume that we are doing the measurement. This latter parameter, is a function of multiple variables, but predominantly it is a function of the size of particles that light is interacting with, as well as the wavelength of the illumination source. So from this simple equation, you can see that the extinction level that is measured by this, uh, this diagnostic is a joint or is a joint function of the number density of the particles that are interacting with the light, as well as the size of those droplets in the field. So with one simple extinction measurement, it is not possible to basically distinguish the contribution of either of these parameters on the, in the extinct amount of light. So as a result, to overcome this limitation, we just use multiple wavelengths simultaneously that are going through the same probe volume in order to decouple the contribution of these two parameters. So here you can see like how we do it. If you do the measurement of the extinction, or if you measure the optical density of the media for wavelength 1 and that for wavelength 2, and we take the ratio of these two, because both beams are traveling through the same probe volume, tra traveling through the same media, then basically this number density and, and uh, integration path lengths will cancel out. And that will leave us with the ratio of extinction cross sections. And I will show you in a bit that that simply correlates with the Sauberman diameter within that probe volume. Here, the wavelength that we use, we use basically two wavelengths for uh, our measurement. The first wavelength is 633 nanometer, that is a red color, and 10.6 micron, which belongs to the mid infrared range. And why we chose these numbers, why we chose these wavelengths, is there are multiple reasons. The first one is that because they're readily available, they're like very cheap lasers generate these two wavelengths. More importantly, they, these two wavelengths generate the sufficient wavelength separation in order to have a sufficient scanning bandwidth so we can uh, determine the sizes of interest in the spray field. And finally, these wavelengths will enable us to avoid the absorption features by liquid fuel droplets. So as I mentioned, this ratio of extinction cross-section correlates with Sauberman diameter. That can be shown using the mean scatter solutions for each given wavelength. If you use like any, any commercially available software to calculate, which here we use the MePlot software to calculate the extinction cross-section, take the ratio of the two, we'll come up with a graph like this, which shows how this ratio varies with the Sauberman diameter. And as you can see, in order to have a unique solution, to have a unique correlation between the ratio and the Sauberman diameter, we can only choose the range that is confined by this uh, gray uh, highlighted region. And if we choose that, that will give us the bandwidth of the scanning bandwidth, which belongs to 10 micron, you know, like something close to 1 micron to 10 micron in size. So with this, we can go ahead and do our setup. And here is the schematic of the actual setup that being put together in the lab. So we first combine and co-align the two laser beams. So here... The choice are arbitrary, like the red represents the CO2 laser and blue represents the red visible light. That's a bit weird, but anyways. 
So we combine them using this coarse plate and then push them through this zinc selenide lens that focuses the tube beam in the middle of the chamber where the spray propagates through. That, uh, this configurate, this optical arrangement will give us 170 micron waist diameter and the sufficient, you know, sufficient depth of focus in order to, to basically gain all the information that we need from the spray. And then the light gets attenuated as it passes through the spray media and then it gets collected again by this lens system and then the two wavelengths will be separated out and each one is directed to its own detection system. So here is the actual setup that's being put together. To the, uh, to the left, we have our transmitter side of the system, which comes with the water-cooled CO2 laser and a helium ion laser right here, and the combining optics that are behind this laser. I'll show you in a bit. And then the two beams are column, they basically are um, co-aligned, and they go through this, this focusing lens, and they focus, they focus into the middle of the chamber where the injector is. You kind of can see like, from this red uh, color of the visible wavelength. And then it gets collected through this uh, receiver side and is being detected, the extinction level is, is detected. So you can imagine this diagnostic, if you just like do a 2D projection of this 3D spray field, this is a point-wise measurement, in a sense. So we need to move the whole system up and down and back and forth in order to scan the 2D field. So that is the reason why we've installed the, uh, the transmitter side and the receiver side on two independent traverse system to, to scan, to basically map out the droplet field of the entire spray. So and here is the, uh, the side view of the transmitter side, which basically shows us all these optics that are used to combine and focus the beam down into the chamber and then receive on the other side of the vessel. But at this stage, we are not quite ready to just like go ahead and just like pull off this in and use it to quantify the spray field. First, we need to address the grand challenge that I was like complaining about like from the beginning of this talk. And that is the, that is the undesirable influence of multiply scattered light because it is traveling through such a dense environment. So uh, when the light beam is traveling through a dense environment, the photons start interacting with not one single droplet, but multiple droplets. Each interaction changes the trajectory of the line. And because the, in reality, the, uh, the collection angle of the system is not zero, we have like a finite collection angle. These multiply scattered light, they may end up landing on the detection system, artificially increasing the intensity of the light recorded by the de detection system, and therefore, underestimating the extinction level of our spray field, which can cause uh, errors in our calculation of the outer mean diameter. To account for that and correct for it, we just go back and look at the Monte Carlo simulations done by, recently done by Berkel and co-workers, where he shows that the, the extinction value of the system, the one on the left side, can be correlated to the actual or realistic extinction of the system where the, all of the contribution of multiply scattered light is, scatter, is uh, rejected through this, through this equation right here. But to do that, we need this transfer function right here. The transfer function is a function of the elimination wavelengths, the size of particles in the media, the collection angle of the system, as well as the optical density or the number density of the droplets in that field that we're trying to quantify. So to, to basically empirically uh, determine that transfer function, here we use the uh, suspensions of polystyrene microspheres in a distilled water. So we can vary the size of these polystyrene particles as well as their number density. And then by measuring this side, and because we know the size and number density of these, uh, these droplets in the field, these particles in the field, we can theoretically calculate the, uh, the optical density, the actual optical density of the media. And then by taking the ratio, we can come up with a graph like this, which shows how multiply scattered light impacts our extinction measurement. And as you can see, when they, the size of droplets get larger and they're going towards like higher number densities, the contribution of these multiply scattered light becomes like very significant. So we can see at optical density of about seven, we have about an order of magnitude error in the measurement if we don't account for the uh, multiple scattering phenomena. So now that we have uh, all these corrections ready, we can go ahead and apply it to, um, to the actual diesel spray. So here, just for the sake of time, I'm only going to show you like one injection scenario. 
and that is a uh, diesel injection of 1500 bar into atmospheric chamber. And the spray that I use is spray D injector from Engine Combustion Network. It is a diesel injector, it's a single hole diesel injector with a nominal size of 185 micron. And uh, so here are some of, the, some of the preliminary results. What we see here are the optical density of the media, the both axial and transverse scan of optical density uh, for both visible and infrared light corresponding to this injection event. There are a few, few interesting uh, phenomena that I would like to highlight before moving on. So the one clear thing to note here is that the spray field is a lot denser for visible light than it is for IR. What it means, it means that the longer wavelengths are better to probe optically dense environments for like the environments with larger um, number density of droplets in it. And also, as you can see, as we move away from the center of the jet towards the periphery, the optical density rapidly starts going down. That is, as I will show you in the next slide, predominantly is because of like reducing the number of the size of the droplets. The droplets get smaller and smaller as we get away from the center. That could be attributed to the, the, the existence of secondary breakup as well as uh, the uh, co added contribution of the shear, shear forces on the, on the jet as we go towards the periphery of the jet. But one other interesting point to note here is that the decay rate in the optical, the decay rate in the optical density is a lot faster for the IR than it is for the visible line. So that could be also uh, explained by the stronger dependence of optical density uh, to drop that size for longer wavelengths. So here is the extinction cross section that's correlated to basically to the uh, size of particles that the line interact with. And this power N is two for visible light, whereas that is five for IR. So that explains why we just like rapidly lose the uh, optical density as we get away from the from the uh, axis of the jet. So now that we have the, the two optical densities, we can take the ratio of them and calculate the um, sat room and diameter and as well as the liquid volume fraction in those exactly the same same spots. So we have here, I'm going to like present you a lower bound and a higher bound for sat room and diameter. Let's focus on the top row here, which is the sat room and diameter. So the lower bound corresponds to uh, the case if you assume that the droplets within the probe volume are monodispersed or close to being monodispersed. They belong to like a, a geometric standard deviation of 1.25, which based on calculation is very close to being monochromatic, uh, sorry, monodispersed. The, the higher bound for it is calculated based on the highly polydispersity within the probe volume. So uh, therefore, the actual uh, droplet size will be somewhere within the two. So as you can see, like one important point to highlight here is that as we go towards the periphery of the jet, the size of particles get smaller and smaller, as we discussed in the previous slide. But what's important, I want to talk about it as, as a challenge, as a remaining challenge, is that if you compare it against like some of the existing results in the literature, which again, like there's not much in the literature, there's only one extra measurement that was conducted in our lab using scattering absorption measurement ratio. And that shows quite a bit of discrepancy, particularly close to the center line of the jet. But this discrepancy goes away as we go towards the periphery, where I guess like the optical density is less and it's like easier to quantify the fields. So we need, therefore, the conclusion is that we need more direct validation of our measurement or any, any measurement really. Now that we have the sodium in diameter, we can simply go ahead and, and calculate the liquid volume fraction, which again like shows like a similar trend to the to the uh, to the SMDs. So with this, I would like to to quickly summarize and, and finalize this talk. Here, I presented you uh, our uh, recent efforts on developing an extinction-based diagnostic for probing optically dense regions of a diesel spray. We generated a custom transfer function to account for the undesirable influence of uh, multiple scattered lights. What I showed you, uh, basically the results showed that the spray field is a lot less dense for longer wavelengths. So if you want to choose, we rather choose longer wavelengths to probe the, to probe the uh, spray field. And again, as I showed you in the previous slide, the sound room in diameter is not that dependent on the approximation of polydispersion in the probe volume. But when it's translated to liquid volume fraction, because that liquid volume fraction 
is a strong function of SMD, that gets amplified, that dependence gets amplified. And finally, as I mentioned, we need a more direct validation of this diagnostic or any diagnostic, really, in these dense environments. With that, I would like to thank NSF for providing the funding, and I would like to thank Sasha, if he's not around, for his technical support over the past year on this, on this, on this effort. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, yeah, so when you were describing how you calibrated this AMF function or whatever, you had, mm -hmm. I'm assuming these were monodispersed particles? They are monodispersed, So yes. how do you go about translating the calibrated function for that to the uh, polydispersed case? And like, what assumptions are you making about the distribution of particles? So here we just like assume that uh, the actual particles that we're dealing with in the, in the spray field are log normal distribution. And all this, uh, this function that is generated up here is based on that approximation of log normal distribution in the, in, the, uh, in the probe volume. And again, just like having a monodisperse just enables us to come up with a clean transfer function like this that we can go back and look at each size, effective size, and at each optical density to, uh, to correct for that. But these are for monodisperse. These are for like monodisperse volumes like that. Is there just like a standard way of combining those for the monodisperse <clears throat> case? Or? Um, I mean, it doesn't really, uh, I guess like the, the confusing part is that like it doesn't really matter what you assume when you have, so it's just like we lump everything with one size. If you assume that it's monodisperse, the Souderman diameter, what we care here is the Souderman diameter. In our actual polydispersed situation, the Souderman diameter just favors towards the larger droplet sizes. Whereas in this case, which because like it's more dispersed, the Souderman diameter is going to be the actual size. So we're just like comparing Souderman diameter to Souderman diameter. So it just like really just doesn't matter because we're just like comparing apple to apple in this case. Okay. If it makes sense. Yes. So what is your probe volume when you compare it to your your thickness of the spray? Yeah, uh, so the probe volume is, <coughs> if I have something in the back of slides, probably not. So anyways, the probe volume is essentially like the waist diameter of it is 170 micron, but the depth of focus is calculated and it's also measured to be roughly two millimeter for the IR because it's like converging so fast and about like 20 millimeter for the visible light because of its like smaller uh, convergence angle, which is, which is uh, basically larger than the widths of, in the regions that we are measuring. So in the regions that we are measuring, we're talking about like millimeter and a half or two millimeters. Because we focus, this is like intentionally designed to, to probe close to the nozzle where the jet is a lot thin. Yeah, like looking at this, you can see like we have like about a millimeter Spray width, like maybe just like millimeter and a half in here. For so the spray when, width. when you like, when you vary at different points, like right, you're obviously moving very small. Uh, but, uh, but between each measurement, you're moving. It's about like 100 micron motion <coughs> yeah, from one point to the next. But your volume is not changing. So how does that affect your measurement? The volume doesn't change with motion. So we're moving yeah, like so the whole optical system. Yeah, so, but your volume is bigger than your thickness, right? Yeah, it just like smooth, just gives results like in such a smooth trend. If you just like compare this to this kind of measurement, which is, um, maybe it's not quite clear in this one. Maybe here it's just like goes up and down. There's like quite a bit of like standard deviation if you use like smaller probe volume instead of this large probe volume. It's just like it smoothens the stuff up. It's just like averages. Presents like a spatial averaging, essentially. Yeah. It seems like a pretty complex setup. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, some challenges that you encountered and how you approached them to, sol to solve them? 
Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, to say it's all about challenges, uh, honestly. Um, so, I mean, like, one of the problems that uh, we had was we we're still, like, looking for a direct validation of our measurements. So we want to, like, have something more dispersed as this case and try to measure the actual size that we know what the size is. But the problem is that the IR wavelengths gets absorbed by pretty much anything. So we were initially thinking about like using a thin layer of water and just like disperse some of these uh, polystyrene microsecure in it. But the IR, as soon as it goes through the water, it gets absorbed. So we have like very high absorbance through that media. That's like one of the problems that we haven't still figured out yet, like how are we gonna handle that? The second problem is that like to come up with a system that transmits both these wavelengths because they're like such different. One is like indivisible and it's like they're like 10 micron apart. And um, there are some material like uh, barium fluoride or zinc selenide to transmit them, but they don't necessarily have the, a good uh, AR coating on them. So, for example, in this lens system that we were, in this lens system that we, we had right here, that is a zinc selenide, which is coated for uh, infrared wavelengths, but it reflects significantly the IR portion. So it transmits some, but we have significant reflections. Now, We've done all the experiments at atmospheric chamber conditions, but now you can imagine if you want to like just you know block the chamber and just like pressurize it, we need to have some kind of windows. That window is going to be zinc selenide most likely, and again we're going to start having a lot of reflections off of the windows, and that's going to come uh, you know just like basically introduce a lot of uh, challenges to the problem, how to handle those reflections. Um, we also like because like anything emits IR. So we, when we heat up the vessel, we're gonna have like significant emission IR emission, which is close to like 10 micron as well, and it's gonna be detected by the by this detector. So we ha also like need to somehow account for that. And the beam steering is going to be another significant challenge to account for when we go to higher pressures and higher temperatures, which at the moment we're working on. Yes. Is there enough uh, liquid in present in the domain, or sorry, uh, gas gas phase stuff that evaporates at all that you would get uh, like uh, differential absorption in the wavelengths by some gas phase species? Uh, I mean, the thing is that, like, the, as I mentioned, like the choice of these lasers, the wavelength is because like they don't get absorbed by the fuel vapor or the gas. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you want to like to be absorbed, you have to like go about like three micron or something. That's like the absorbs, you know, the spectra of the um, fuel fuel species, if you want to call it. But like choosing like ten micron, that pretty much like avoids any absorbers, absorbance at these uh, at these environments. Yes. Can you comment on how do you separate the combined beams uh, at the receiver? Like, oh yeah, um, so I don't know if that's quite clear here. So <coughs> you see like we have a zinc selenide plate. So that plate is coated to reflect visible light, but it transmits with IR. So essentially like it's like a dichroic mirror mm -hmm. in a sense. So longer wavelengths go through without getting reflected and the visible wavelengths partially go through, but most of it gets reflected. Like 90% or so gets reflected off of this plate. Um, is there any power loss due to this? Um, yeah, I mean, just like when light go through anything, the power yeah. gets lost. Like, but the, could, could that affect your data? No, I mean, as long as like, I know, so what I do is just like, I measure the light power with this detector without any sprays, like with actual system. And then when the spray comes in, like it already counts all the absorbance along the system. So uh, it, everything is like already taken into account when we do the measurement. Okay, let's thank our speaker.